So over the past few months, a lot of people have been asking me to give my opinion on Fujifilm's GFX system. Now, as some of you may know, Fujifilm has been kind enough to continue loaning me gear uh, throughout the past seven, eight, nine months, and most notably their GFX system so that I can be able to give my, well, unfiltered opinion on a lot of these things. And I've been putting it off for the reason of, I don't believe in reviewers who get something for 15 to 30 to 60 to 90 days only, using them sparingly and not for their paid work that they have to put their neck out on the line for, um, and then giving you an opinion on something just because they shot some charts and because they did one photo walk with it. So for me personally, over the past few months, I have used these, uh, these GFX cameras and not only personal situations, street photography, family, etc uh, self-portraits but also I've used these cameras and this system um, completely for some paid work and with that I would like to finally give you my ideas and what I feel like not only this camera system is capable of what the future of it will look like and who it's for but also just give you a non bullshit idea of what you're getting yourself into. So unlike a lot of other videos to where I'm able to go off the top of my head, I've actually been taking notes on the GFX system. And there's some things I'm gonna get into, there are some things and questions that I'm going to answer that people have asked me. And just to give you guys a heads up, this is not gonna be a video with a whole bunch of B-roll and things like that. And uh, I might put up, I'm probably going to put up a lot of the photos I've taken, but this isn't necessarily going to focus on just those things because I believe there's so much more to the nuances of the camera and the bodies. I'll go into that, I'll go in specifically into the bodies that I've used, and I won't make any judgments or opinions on bodies or lenses that I feel like I didn't have long enough in order to give you the full scope of everything, but I'll give you a general understanding of not only the value you're getting into, but also how it stands against other camera systems. Now, there are going to be three people that are going to automatically, off the bat from my first few statements, hate uh, me and this video and leave negative comments down below. Number one, it's full frame fanboys and people that have to put their whole personality into the fact that their camera has uh, eye autofocus and it does everything for them. If you're a full frame fanboy, beware. Also, if you're a bokeh whore and someone who has to shoot everything wide open and to you, that's the style you like, but you like to put pressure on others and make them believe that if they don't shoot like you, then their lenses or their body or their work isn't as nice as yours, you're also going to hate this. And the last person who's going to hate this are GFX fanboys themselves and people that are in the GFX system um, that I believe potentially may have wasted their money on the GFX system. Uh, FX system, GFX system, but I'll get in that a little bit further. So to start off with, um, I've used the Fujifilm GFX system for about seven months now. And here are my thoughts. First thing I want to start off with, because this is going to take the majority of the time explaining, and that is autofocus. When it comes to the autofocus, it's just fine. It's way better than Panasonic, what they've been doing. And it's as snappy as the pre-firmware update for the X-H1, which if any of you need to know what that is, it's about on par with Canon EOS R before its original update and the Sony a7 II before it's up or after all of its updates before the release of the a7 III. The cameras with phase detect autofocus that I've used, um, a la the GFX 100S, does focus a little bit better than, let's say, the newest GFX 50S II. And that is attributed to the phase detect autofocus. The fact that the eye autofocus is sticky and moves around with the subject or with multiple times that I was using it, would see that it would pick a subject out of a group and be able to stick on that one eye and move around with it to be able to determine focus. There's a lot of good things that come out of this. Now, it is not the fastest autofocus. You're never gonna, you're never gonna get Sony A1 uh, speed, Canon R3 speed. You're never gonna get Nike. Con Z9 speed, you're never even going to get at this point in time uh, Fujifilm X-T4 speed. But one thing to keep in mind is who this camera system is for really. If you're planning on shooting sports photography and things like that, this system may not be for someone who's shooting something that is during mid play, meaning during the action. Now pre-snap, post-snap, um, you know, while the batter's in the batter box, uh, pitcher going through his wind up, uh, maybe people are setting up on the pitch um, during a corner kick or something like that, a timeout during the court, people shooting free throws, um, even someone coming on a fast break if you stop down a little bit or know how to choose your point. These cameras, all of them, including including the, the contrast detect autofocus ones like the GFX 50R and the 50S2 and the 50S, they're gonna do just fine. But just me being honest, whenever I did track like my dog running around playing fetch and things, I got some shots, but I did miss a few because he's running at zoomy speed. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of you have to know what you're using it for. I'm never gonna say that anyone should go uh, and 
take a GFX camera and go out and shoot, shoot sports. And majority of you who are looking at GFX cameras, that's not the direction you're looking to go. And so you have to know yourself, you have to be honest with yourself, and you can't bitch about limitations in something whenever apparently you don't know the correct gear to purchase for the work that you're doing. Um, so when it comes to autofocus, listen, autofocus to me, it is never a big deal whatsoever. Um, and I never have relied on eye autofocus. Even right now, whenever I'm shooting, whether it's with my X100V, is the X Pro 3, whether it was the EOS R, whether it was my A7 III, I still prefer to not rely specifically and only on eye autofocus for shooting. But when it comes to the whole gamut of things, you're getting that kind of performance. Think original launch EOS R. If you're in the Sony land, think A7 II, whenever it was this furthest update before the A7 III uh, release, meaning that it's not horrible autofocus. And that if someone's standing in front of you and they're static, it's going to be just fine. Introduce a little movement, it's going to be just fine. But introduce a lot of not back and forth horizontal on the same plane, but it's the front to back, which is going to cause a lot of the issues for you where you may have some jitter, you may have some jump. If you shoot Fujifilm, I would reckon this to pre-firmware update X-H1 using some of the older lenses, like let's say a 35 1.4 to where walking back and forth presents a lot of issues when your subject is making that kind of movement. So when it comes to ergonomics, this is one thing that I was super impressed with. Ergonomics are wildly comfortable. It's about the size of a DSLR for the most part in all of them, uh, d depending on the kind of body style. Uh, but the weight and balance are more manageable due to no mirror and correct button placement for someone like me with large hands. It feels right in the hand. Everything is where it needs to be. The buttons are strategically and fantastically placed. When there's an open space for your thumb to sit on all of their cameras, it's a fine open space to where you have a little bit of wiggle room and movement to move back and forth if you're having to orientate and change the position of your wrist to where you're not hitting anything. But at the same time, every button that you need to get to is close enough to be able to reach. And every single one of them, the ergonomics are great. The button placement for the shutter was fantastic. Uh, the, the, the clickiness of the buttons is great. The feedback is fantastic. The fill-in is fantastic. There is no doubt that you hit a button when you hit a button and that you press something. Um, and also, everything's just right where you need it to be. These are, for the most part, two-handed cameras if you want to be able to stabilize, if you want to hold them. And the two-handed cameras, the buttons just fall right where you would want them and expect them to be. So I'm a huge fan of the ergonomics. It feels fantastic. Again, as someone who came from DSLR, these are great ergonomics. It feels feels great. It is a beauty to hold in every sense of the word. Might be one of the most comfortable mirrorless cameras. Again, Leica's SL line just has something about it. They feel great. Everything's right where it needs to be. The feedback's great. Leica SL, GFX camera, they're two things that are really running up um, the score on every other camera company when it comes to ergonomics. Um, controls are great. They're nothing uh, that you're going to notice when you use it, which is how it should be. Um, things should feel intuitive and in reach. I shouldn't notice anything. I should just be able to work. That's an honest note about it. Um, when you're handling a camera, the first thing that will bother you the most is if you keep on accidentally pressing a button. That is pet peeve type shit. That is annoying. And at the same time, the most important thing is for you to be able to reach everything but you're never accidentally bumping everything I should not ever have to wonder where the cameras are where the buttons are in a camera and at the same time I should never know whenever I'm not focusing on it where the buttons are in the camera because I'm touching them there's a fine line to work in a camera company and where exactly button placement is very goes from helpful to too helpful and in the way and somehow in the GFX system Fujifilm got it right now on their other cameras they completely butchered it okay Fujifilm stop butchering don't remove pads like stop it stop what you're doing with the tiny ass buttons and moving things to weird awkward places not everyone has the hands the size of a small dog's paw like you need to give a little bit more relief to that bring back the d-pad but uh yeah uh, the gfx system is fantastic with that across the board all of them are great even the gfx 50r it's like a larger x pro 3 but again the feedback the weight the grip everything the ergonomics were fantastic even on that one it's a joy to carry around a little bit lighter it's a great camera ibis in the body this is something i want to talk about ibis and the systems that have it so i tried the gfx 100s and the 50s2 and they were both amazing the ibis is fantastic uh honestly to have a sensor that size and be able to to have that good of image, stabili image stabilization is amazing. Um, and you're able to actually rely on it. 
and rely that it's going to eliminate shake in some of your longer, heavier lenses um, in the GFXs, which they get long and heavier, um, and you're able to eliminate a lot of shake in those. The Ergos with the Ib Ibis work fantastic and perfectly. Honestly, I've got a boy, Jason Key from a boy, Darren Lingerfeld. Shout out to you guys. They also shoot Fujifilm, the GFX system, and they will tell you the Ibis in these systems is fantastic, but the fact that they never complain about it when you consider how big the sensor is speaks a lot more to it. When you're thinking about, okay, how's the Ibis in it? Is it good enough? Yes, it is fantastic. And even more, a lot of people put a lot of hate on the video side of the GFX system, and I get it, the GFX 50R, very underwhelming in video. 50S, very underwhelming in video, but let's say you have something like the 100S, or the 50S2, which may not have all the codecs and the bits rates and things like that that you want, but at the same time, everyone that come 90% of people that I hear on YouTube complain about codec and bit rates and things like that in their camera um, are using cameras that if you care about codec and bit rate then um, you wouldn't be using those cameras so their opinion and things like that null and void doesn't matter just slap a lot on there anyway because that's what you're gonna do you're just gonna buy something from you know Chris Howe or something like that which is totally fine but quit bitching about things that don't necessarily affect you and matter to you because YouTube's gonna compress your crappy video anyway but whenever it comes to video you can really rely on the IBIS especially Especially uh, whenever it comes to uh, being able to shoot b-roll and things I actually shot a lot of my videos um, here on this channel using the GFX 100s and the 50s 2 some of them I told you about a lot of them I didn't but the whole thing was um, it is very capable whenever it comes to video and the IBIS is a big part of that the IBIS and the GFX systems is great it makes me excited about the Fujifilm um, APS-C line the X body system because if they can do so many great things with this it's only a matter of time before they're able to bring that technology in and that influence and that passion into their APS-C line. But whenever it comes to medium format um, IBIS, I'm telling you right now, um, if you're a Sony shooter, you, you've already got better IBIS than the GFX line. If you're a Canon shooter, which I've, this is on limited experience, the IBIS and the GFX bodies are a lot better. Think of how big that sensor is and the fact that it's on par or better than a lot of your top range uh, cameras, that is a big ass deal and they go and they show out and they stun. Battery life is just on par with average battery life for everything else. Battery life is nothing to write home about. Yes, it has a bigger, uh bigger camera or a bigger battery but at the same time it's having to process these huge ass files anyway and these files are huge um, I didn't really notice any take on battery life every time I use a GFX system I shot no no more or I shot around 30 to 60 shots no more than that so it's not like I was really out there all day every day but there were times where I could go three to four days I was shooting back to back to back and I didn't have to charge the battery until maybe that fourth or fifth day whenever I see the blinking light maybe if I'm shooting a video so at the same time it's not like um, you know it's, it's not great, but it's never going to be bad. So whenever it comes to um, that, also with the huge files, um, there's a reason for that huge file size. Um, this is a fantastic, um, you know, sensor. Uh, these 50 megapixel file sizes, uh, these these 100 megapixel uh, uh, file sizes, I, I think anywhere from 300 megabytes is what I had whenever I was uncompressed um, raw on the 100S. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember the file size of things, but they were big. It took a long time to edit them on my old Mac, and so I actually started using my iPad uh, Air uh, Generation 4 to edit them, which did a little bit better, but I could tell it was big. I was having to offload a lot of images, but the images are great. They're fantastic. The latitude and color is one thing that I I, I keep saying people to want to talk about dynamic range and they want to talk about bokeh and all this bullshit stuff whenever it comes to shooting. First off, you want to control your dynamic range, shoot under one third, shoot one third stop under exposed on average metering. You're never going to have an issue on a GFX lineup or for that matter, any camera because for the love of your life and my life, digital cameras will always handle underexposed images better than film cameras ever would in the same way that film cameras will always uh, uh, be able to handle overexposed areas and highlights better than anything in digital. So with that out of the way, let me continue this, th this conversation whenever it comes to the images. Listen. The images here, the highlight of GFX images is not, to me, the, uh, the the file size, being able to pixel peep. Yeah, it's great. You can pixel peep. You can do it, do like a million things. I've got so many videos in the GFX lineup where you see I'm cropping into 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 time crop 
and it still looks fresh and still looks completely sharp. Um, and I'm, you're able to make maybe nine, 10 images out of it. If you're someone who's an e-commerce, who's taking an image of a model and they've got multiple items of jewelry, clothing, hats, etc., or their face that you want to highlight for a single, um, I, I think of Gap. They used to have um, on their uh, website where they would have a model standing, taking a photo, and then the next you swipe over, the image would be the same photo, but it would be keyed in on multiple areas. And then whenever you go down to get more of a description, like on an H&M, it would be the exact same photo, but keyed in on different areas with different things. If they're talking about accessories, you can match with it. They would put links and they would highlight the accessories. If you're that kind of person who's shooting that kind of e-commerce, shooting that kind of uh, fashion photography, this is going to be great for you. Someone who shoots portraits and you like to touch up, you're a retouching kind of son of a gun, it's going to be great for you. If you're someone who likes to shoot landscapes, it's going to be fantastic for you. If you're someone who likes to shoot things for business, product photography, this is going to be great for you. Um, and so pixel peeping, being able to zoom, crop in a lot of times, it's going to be great. Mind you, the detail in this is far away better than any 60, 70, 80 megapixel full frame camera you're going to get. Don't let anyone tell you any, uh, any different. 50 megapixels on a GFS, GFX digital medium format sensor is still going to get you at least in my in my opinion in my eyes and guys listen i don't get paid by anyone for this and i don't give a shit i'm the kind of person that you know like if i can ever get my hands on nikon z9 and use that for sports i'll drop everything to go to nikon but at the same time it's going to be better gfx is going to be better than anything whenever it comes to capturing detail and more information and the larger pixel sizes than anything you're going to get out of full frame APS-C, micro four thirds it's a huge ass gap um but when it comes to the highlight it's the latitude and colors you're able to really adjust colors so well without having bleed onto every other thing you're able to control tones so much better um your warmth uh and cool is not affected uh, as dramatically when you're going and you're adjusting colors uh, separately um you're able to get more in the sense of micro contrast in the same way in these images especially in areas where colors are hitting against each other that is a big issue in a lot of cameras especially smaller sensor cameras in the APS-C line of cameras and Fujifilm if you ever go in and you have two bright colors uh, attacking each other you're going to introduce a lot more worms in those areas and those lines in between especially if there's some brightness um, and the, the GFX cameras do a great job of fixing that up the other thing about these files is you still have the amazing film uh, film emulation simulations the film recipes whatever they are from Fujifilm cameras you're able to have things like and almost all of them you're gonna have a nostalgic negative which is my favorite um, setup now I love editing to look like nostalgic negative because it's just great it has a fantastic natural warmth everything's very um, what the eye sees it's not very it's not neutral or desaturated like a lot of other stuff that people like and it gets you out of the trend and the fad of this whole thing where i'm going to just oversaturate my colors in this area that are reds and yellows and then desaturate everything and uh, oversaturate greens and bring my blues to teal that you're seeing in a lot of people shoot it makes things realistic um, and it's kind of what your eye sees. So I love it. You're able to shoot JPEGs with this with straight out of camera look fantastic as well. You can still add your grain and stuff. So you can actually have Fujifilm, excuse me, film recipes in your camera the same way you would have on an X-Pro3 or your GFX camera. And it's fantastic. It's great. The images, I, I, you have to try them for yourself. I'm going to have to put a few up on here. Or if you guys ask me for them, I'll send them to you. The images are something else, man. You'll love them. The amount of dynamic range is still great. Um, it's great. Now, the processing speed in the camera, it's a little bit slower than your regular mirrorless cameras, and that's what you'd expect. It's just, it's doing a lot more work. Um, but, and it's not something that, you know, you would ever use for sports, but also it may be something that upsets you in cameras. Now, the reason is because of this, because after every snap, you're getting a little bit more lag, even whenever you're shooting electronic shutter, because that camera's having a process. Where does that affect you most? In your focus. So yes, again, if people are going horizontal side to side, you're able to capture a little bit more and it's not as noticeable, but that's why the walking back and forth is such an issue because the lag in processing, and this is just me being honest. Listen, if you're shooting weddings at this point right now, and you were to get a GFX camera, I would get a GFX 100S or a 50S2, and that's it. Reason being is because if you want that to be your full-time wedding um, camera, you're either going to have to do a complete workaround on the fact that coming front to back, the focus may not be that great. You're going to have to learn how to shoot um, stop down a little bit, which I know that offends a lot of people. Um, but even more than that, um, the issue is just the, the, the buff. I mean, it's not buffering. It's just the processing. It's a lot of processing, especially if you're shooting, um, you want to have JPEGs and raw, you want to put a little bit of grain into it. You want to make slight adjustments to your film simulations. I mean, it, it takes a lot. It is a lot of work. It is taxing on the camera. 
camera, the processors, no matter how good they are, it's still a digital medium format, which may not be as big as film medium format, but it's still a, a larger sensor and it's having to read out a lot of stuff. Fujifilm is not there yet with the kind of readout speeds of a Sony A1 that and a, and a chip and processing like that and a medium format camera that would make it to where it shoots like that and it's a breeze. They're not there yet, but they're on their way and they're doing good. These are great iterations. I think if you get the 50S II and the 100S, you're going to be happy whenever they release more and they're able to get firmware updates because you're probably going to see the benefits and cameras that are kind of really affordable, honestly, right now. They're cheaper than Leica's, cheaper than Sony Z camera, some of the, I think the Z9, cheaper than an R3, I believe, um, uh, cheaper than some of the Panasonic cameras. I mean, the fact that you can get um, digital medium format for so cheap that gives you a better quality image. Now the performance may not meet, be, be on par with you, but the image is way better than anything you're gonna get from anything else, just me being objective. Um, even in your 60 megapixel M11s, even in your um, you know 70 megapixel, 80 megapixel, whatever, um, A7R cameras, the GFX line, even at the 50 megapixel range, is gonna give you more detail, more clarity, more dynamic range, more micro contrast, and your ability to be able to jump deeper into an image, to be able to crop and still keep all, that, all those things with your resolution is higher than in any of those cameras so um, there is that the other thing to talk about is just the lenses the lenses are great but they're heavy as shit okay you're not gonna be able to fit as many in your bag and they're probably gonna you know upset you the, the, the zoom lenses are nice because even though they may not be as fast wide open, they focus a lot quicker actually than the prime lenses. I'm not sure if it's because the motor's in there or what, but the zoom lenses focus for the most part better than the prime lenses except the GFX 50, uh, or sorry, the GF 50 uh, 3.5, which is a 40 millimeter if you shoot the smaller sensor size and full frame, the tiny full frame sensor. Um, which is a more of a 42.8 to that um, it is probably their fastest lens out right now. It's a fantastic lens, tack sharp. It's a go everywhere lens. It's small enough. You put that on the 50R, and you're walking around with basically, uh, you know, the perfect point and shoot camera if you want high resolution, or the perfect camera to be able to shoot street street with if you want to make big large prints. Um, it's it's a great camera. It's an all around camera. It's a versatile camera. You're still getting a great amount of bokeh. I did a full shoot with it with the, with a with a client of mine um, for his album covers. And, uh, and yeah, it's fantastic. It's a great lens. You're getting so much detail. Again, the color is great. I love that camera and I love that lens combination. But lenses are great. They're tack sharp. They're fantastic. But there is one thing that's been talked about and it's been depth of field in bokeh. Yes, you can reach the exact same depth of field as you as you can a GFX camera. You can recreate it if you're able to, uh, you know, stop down or find a uh, full frame camera with the, you know, a similar uh, depth of field once you do conversion. Yeah, you can make them look exactly the same. In the same way that if I, I can drive my Bugatti at 30 miles an hour the same way a Honda Civic could drive a, uh, at 30 miles an hour. And if I was to race those um, and they could only both go 30 miles an hour, they're probably going to tie. So it's the exact same sense. You see, you've got one thing that's great on gas mileage, um, you know, that's going to, uh, you know, get the job done. Maybe it doesn't accelerate too, too fast, but you know what? It'll get you point A to point B and it'll do everything you want to do. And then you have one that's built for sport and luxury and built for something niche that you're maybe not taking out all the time or that is actually supposed to be vroom vroom fast that can go probably about you know um i could probably beat it in a in a heads up race but if you cripple them both to 30 miles an hour you're going to be at 30 miles an hour regardless they're going to finish the same pace and that's the same way whenever it comes to the topic about the lenses in these systems yeah you're not going to get as great as bokeh no there's not a 1.2 gfx le uh, lens uh in the system right now but at the same time who gives a shit who cares since when did bokeh become the gold standard for for professional photos and all that tells me is you don't understand photography. That's all it is. Because if all you do is shoot at 1.2 and then you're telling people that a system isn't that great because it doesn't have 1.2, it's not the system isn't great. It's just that you don't know how to shoot without that. That's your crutch. And you're probably a shitty photographer in any kind of situation to where you don't bring your ND filter and you don't bring your flashes to back up against the sun. So if you guys want to continue to shoot backlit like shit, Go for it. But that whole thing about, oh, you know, the lenses aren't fast enough. It's like, listen, if you want bokeh, check out my boy Darren Lingefelter and, and or Ding, sorry, Darren Lingefelt and my boy Jason Kiefer. Frick, I keep on adding the ER on the wrong side. Darren Lingefelt and Jason Kiefer, they've got more than enough photos that will really rest, make your mind rest easy whenever it comes to bokeh in these lenses. They also adapt third party, uh, third party lenses on them, manual focus, that give them a little bit more speed. But still, it doesn't even matter. The reason being, because they're more wowed by the rest 
resolution and their ability to be able to manipulate these images and how reliable these cameras are in the actual field, not shooting a chart, not shooting a damn Lego in the field than anything else. And that's the last thing that I want to get into when it comes to GFX system. Listen, if you choose to buy this camera system, I don't think it's for everyone. I think it's still priced at a point to where if you were to buy it today and you're either a hobbyist or someone who only shoots portraits every once in a while, or you, you know, someone who doesn't get paid um, enough to where within one year you're paying off the camera and the lens combinations you buy for it, I think it's a complete damn waste of money. Buy an EOS R, which is the hands down flat best deal. The EOS R systems, the RF mount lenses, they're 50, they're 35, and they're 85 that are their more budget um, type. Comparing that up with a Canon EOS R is by far the best deal you can get right now. 30 megapixels, it's pretty good after an update. When it comes to taking stills, the images really never looked bad. I always loved my EOS R images. It's hands down the best thing that you can buy on the market. I, I, I refer it, I refer it uh, more than buying an X-T3, um, uh, more than buying an X-T4 for the simple reason is I'm seeing them at $950 on Facebook marketplaces, um, sometimes packaged with one to two of those Fujifilm or those Canon lenses like the 51.8 and 35.1.8 for $1,400. That is a steal for what you're getting. You're getting a fantastic camera with a fantastic uh, a couple of lenses. That's a good deal. Now, with me saying that, if you're someone who is doing the things like I mentioned earlier, e-commerce, fashion, you're shooting a lot of portraits, maybe you're someone who wants to make the step because you're shooting a lot of product photography and you want to get uh, better product shots, maybe you're shooting something that needs to have uh, uh, you know, full-size printouts, banners that you're hanging down, sports photographer, etc., and you're doing a lot of sports portrait. Yeah, the camera's, the camera's fine. The camera's good for you. If you can make your money back. Remember guys, I always care more about are you making wise spending decisions than I do is the camera cool. Because the camera being cool, the technology being cool doesn't mean shit. You can buy a Sony A1 right now. And if all you're doing is shooting your kid running around the yard and you're using it three times a week, or let's say it's even worse and more realistic. Let's say you're using it five to six times a month. It's not worth it. It really isn't. It really isn't. It's not worth it. If you're out here and you have an X Pro 3 and you got it for, or for street photography, but you only shoot street once a month, it's not worth it. It was not worth purchasing that. You could have bought an X Pro 2, an X Pro 1. It's not worth it. If you're someone who's like, oh, you know what? I need this 70 to 200 or this 50 to 140, um, whichever ones, because I want to shoot sports. I want to shoot this. I want to shoot wildlife. And you've never done it still to this day and you have it and you're only using it for portraits. You can get better images out of 90 millimeter f2 and save yourself a buck everything that you're doing in photography and this is from life as me as someone who's been paid to do photography whenever i have my business on my own and now that i do it just on the side to be able to create extra income but i'm still putting myself out there the goal is always to make more money and the words of kobe being bryant rest in peace the always is the goal is always to not take a pay cut and when you're um, spending more money on cameras that you don't need that are going to do the exact same thing as something that you could have bought that is cheaper, you're taking a pay cut. Why buy this GFX system for its 100 megapixels when you don't have a monitor that will show you the full 100 megapixels and you never print your images? Why would you do that? Why would you buy a GFX system and it's 100 megapixels when all you do is you shoot maybe two to three portraits a month and they're not even paid when you could have bought an XT2 and done the exact same shots? There's no need to do that. With that being said, that's the full roundup of my GFX system, uh, uh, GFX system line ideas and how I feel about it. If you have any questions, you can ask me about exactly what I think about it down below in the comments where I can give you more um, just direction and things like that. Again, it's a fantastic system, but if I think hobbyists and you know people that are just enthusiasts and people that want to just have one should get one, hell no. Not at all. But have a good one.